When we open the newspaper in the morning, the thing that probably hits us more than anything else is stuff about food and diet. It's absolutely a recurring theme in terms of information and misinformation that's out there. And no wonder, because for obvious reasons, it's quite important to all of us. So for that reason, we have two great speakers here tonight to talk about different areas of diet. Um, after Steph, Jen will be speaking. Jen is a registered dietitian. She is an expert for the Healthy Food Guide, and she is also a media spokesperson for the British Dietetic Association. And for those of you that don't know the difference between a dietitian and a nutritionist, that's a, perhaps a good question to ask Jen. <laughs> <laughs> um, after Jen, we've got Anthony, otherwise known as The Angry Chef, which is a blog um, that goes after lies, pretensions, and stu stupidity in the food industry. And Anthony will be talking to us about... Um, clean eating, the trend off. So um, after those speakers, five, ten minutes each, as um, you heard, we will have a break. During that break, there will be a game. And after that break and that game, there will be a Q&A, which I will be trying to wrestle, moderate, get something useful out of. We are an amazingly, brilliantly full room tonight, so I'll do my best to try and keep that discussion focused. But do, therefore, start thinking of questions that you could ask the panel as we go along. You can think of it during the break and then ask those questions succinctly. <laughs> anyway, that's enough for me. So, first speaker is Steph. Steph is an ambassador of the Sense About Science's Ask for Evidence campaign. Steph is also a member of our Voice Network, Voice of Young Science. Steph will tell you about those things, how you can get involved in this kind of work, and will kick us off. So, without anything else, Steph. Okay. Um, I think I should get up. I don't know. Um, okay. Uh, cool. So as Max just introduced me, I'm Steph, and at the moment I'm doing, well, I'm finishing my PhD at King's College London. Um, I'm also a member, as he said, of the Voice Network. And basically what the Voice Network is all about is for early career scientists um, who want to advocate for better use of science and evidence in the public discussion. Um, and basically what we do is, in the public eye, we challenge misconceptions, um, yeah, and basically respond to misinformation in the media and go after um, companies that make misleading product claims. Um, so, as Max also said, nutrition is something that keeps coming up because I'm sure you're aware people care about the things they put in their bodies. Um, and so, uh, this is something that Voice of Young Science has worked with quite a lot. Uh, so I'm going to give you some examples of the kind of uh, replies that we've received from certain companies about their nutritional claims. Um, so in their 2007 dossier, uh, there goes the science bit. Um, Voice of Young Science members basically just called up companies and asked them about sort of sciencey sounding claims they were making about products. Um, and Alice called up the food chain giant Pret a Manger uh, and asked them why they kept talking about nasty chemicals and why they avoided them and why natural was better. And after a bit of prodding and probing, she got told by Pret's commercial director that there was no scientific basis for these marketing claims. So often, healthy eating can just be a marketing claim. Um, in a similar kind of vein, Voice of Young Science has also asked companies about claims about their detox products. And uh, I'm sure you've seen a huge amount of uh, types of detox products uh, everywhere from foot pads to nutritional supplements to hair straighteners. Turns out uh, there's not a whole lot of evidence for the concept of detox and many companies don't even use the same definition. Um, so the other place where I always encounter misinformation and where it always um, annoys me <laughs> quite uh, <laughs> substantially is on the internet. Um, and fad diets run rampant on the internet. I'm sure if you've spent any time on health food blogs, you'll have come across fad diets. Um, the, pro the problem is that um, if done right, diets can help us eat better, can help us lose weight and be healthier. Um, but this kind of information is being drowned out by self-elected food experts, bloggers, uh, and Facebook. <laughs> So Voice of Young Science decided to go after this um, type of information by creating a um, spoof diet quiz. They basically just made up their own internet fad diets and mixed them up into a quiz with uh, internet fad diets that you can actually find. Um, and this was basically widely covered by the media. And the point of this was to show that 
Some fad diets are so ridiculous that you may as well make them up. So, what I want to do now is uh, play with you the fad diet quiz, or part of the fad diet quiz. And let me tell you, it's uh, a lot harder to tell them apart than you might think. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you the definition of, this, of, the, of the diet, and you tell me, well, probably raise hands, um, whether you think it's a spoof or if you think uh, it's a real internet fad diet. Um, let's start with the no food diet. Eating food is a waste of time. No, why not drink a nutrient-rich substitute instead? Who thinks it's spoof? No one. It's <laughs> one person. Okay. <laughs> Who thinks it's not a spoof? <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> you guys spend too much time on the internet. It's not a spoof. Um, how about um, microbe assisted dieting? If you take one shot of probiotic bacteria each meal, the, bacteri the bacteria will quote your stomach and regulate your sugar and fat intake. Who thinks it's a spoof? Uh, not too many, okay. And the rest think it's no spoof. No no spoof, okay. Well, uh, it is a spoof. <laughs> Our voice members came up with this one. But you'd think it would be real, thinking about Activia and all these things. Um, let's go for another one. Um, beans, bananas, and belly dancing. Um, <laughs> if you combine flatulence-inducing beans with high-fiber bananas, um, you can get a dramatic incre increase in bowel movement, and when you combine this with be belly dancing, you will shed pounds like no business. Who thinks, who thinks this one is a, a spoof? <laughs> okay, quite a few people. No spoof? Cool. Yeah, well, the first people would be right. It, it, this is definitely something that uh, our voice members came up with. So the point I'm trying to make with this is you can't really tell apart what what you read on the internet is actually science-based or not. So it is in all our interest because we can harm our health with this kind of stuff and spend our money on nutritional supplements that don't do anything to basically <coughs> just stop for a second and think about whether the things that you're being told are true. Ask the company whether what they're telling you is nonsense <laughs> or whether they have any evidence to show for it. Um, and basically you're better off. So. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Brett, so, I've got lots of questions following that, so I may <laughs> have to hijack the Q&A. Uh, next up, we've got Jen. So, as I said, Jen um, it will, well, no, maybe I didn't say Jen will be speaking about low-carb, high-fat diets, particularly uh, in her, her expert role. So, Jen, please take away. Okay. Do you mind if I stand up? Because I feel like I can see people down there I can't see otherwise. <laughs> My happy is standing. <laughs> um, so, carbs are bad, fat is good, and the healthy eating guidelines that we've been following for the last 30 years are completely out of date. I'm sure all of you have probably seen headlines saying as such. Um, so, what is there anything good about a low-carb diet, and um, is there actually any evidence for it? Advocates of the low-carb diets say that by reducing your carbohydrate levels, um, you can reduce your insulin levels and your appetite, lead to weight loss and improve blood cholesterol levels um, and there are studies to back these claims. Now the problem with low carbohydrate diet is that there's no one definition of a low carbohydrate diet so all of the low carbohydrate diet studies will all have slightly different levels of carbohydrates. Um, and what nutrients might you be missing out on if you don't include, include carbs in your diet? My concern about this kind of diet is that most low-carb diets will cut out whole grains. Um, some will also cut out beans and pulses, and some even cut out fruit. So obviously you can be missing quite a few nutrients if you start doing that. Um, you can be low in fibre. The recommended amount of fibre now is 30 grams a day. We should all be trying to meet. We're not. We're getting about 18. Um, B vitamins. Whole grains are a really important source of B vitamins. And you might also be missing out on helpful antioxidants from the whole grains, you get selenium and vitamin E, but also if you start cutting fruit down or out of people's diets, then you also are missing a vast array of antioxidants. Um, everybody's much more interested in weight loss generally, so people follow a low-carb diet to try and lose weight. Um, so does a low-carb diet actually lead to more weight loss than a low-fat diet, for example? 
Um, two large meta-analysis have found that there's no significant, uh, of RCTs, I might add, um, found that there's no significant difference in weight loss over 12 months in overweight and obese people um, between the two types of diet. So actually, either works. Um, a low-carb diet, depending on the quantities of carbs allowed, might not actually be meeting the healthy guidelines in terms of the percentage of carbs that it allows. Um, so we should all be having around about 50% of our diet as carbohydrates. So, so actually, both work, but both work if you are on a calorie-restricted um, diet in the first place. What about saturated fats? So there's, there's lots in the headlines at the moment about you know, fats are okay, we shouldn't be really cutting down on saturated fats. Um, a Cochrane review that came out last year, which I don't know what all your background is, but Cochrane reviews are really highly regarded systematic reviews, um, found that there was a 17% reduction in the risk of cardiovascular disease, so both heart disease and stroke. They concluded that the studies provided moderate quality evidence that reducing saturated fat and replacing it with polyunsaturated fats actually reduces our risk of heart disease. Now, there's no benefit of reducing saturated fat and replacing it with starchy carbohydrates. So that's maybe where these headlines are sort of coming from. So what annoys me most about the message of the low-carb, high-fat? I think the main thing is that food is more than just about the nutrients. You know, food plays a massive role in all of our lives, not just to keep us alive and keep us healthy, but actually socially and culturally as well. Um, we don't eat nutrients, we eat whole foods, and each food will contain a mixture of the mac macronutrients. Um, at the end of the day, we all need to be choosing foods that are good for us the majority of the time, not beating ourselves up if we want the occasional treat. And if every expert in the media could be promoting the same healthy eating guidelines, encouraging people to follow a Mediterranean-based diet, um, and you know, people watching their portion sizes and reducing sugar, I'm completely up for reducing sugar, then I think the UK would be a, a much healthier place to be. Um, yeah, I think um, generally as well, low-carb diets, you have to also think about socially for people, the expense and also um, the, the ability for people to maintain those long-term. And they might work for some people, but they're not going to work for everybody. Everybody's an individual. And certainly if I... Um, told my three-year-old she was no longer allowed carbohydrates, I think I would have quite a fight on my hands. <laughs> That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jen. I've got more questions for you. <laughs> right, so now we have got Anthony, uh, the angry chef. Right, okay. Peace <laughs> again. <laughs> okay, hello. Um, evening. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I um, a bit of a confession, I'm not a scientist, so I feel slightly out of place. Um, I, I'm a chef, I'm a real chef, I work um, as a development chef. I also write a blog, I think some of you might be aware of, which is called the Angle Chef blog. Has anyone, anyone read yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Well, make sure you read it. Go back. <laughs> <laughs> very, 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 very good. Very good. <laughs> Lots of dietitians enjoy it. Um, okay. <laughs> My, my blog exposes lies about food, and, and one that comes to my attention more and more and more since I've been writing it to, um, for, mo for most of this year is clean eating, which is this big new trend. Um, we're told it's the path to a happy, healthy lifestyle. Um, if you go back to sort of the 80s and 90s, constant dieting was, was the, the must-have accessory for every celebrity. That was how you achieve weight loss and how you achieve success. But now, for the millennial generation, that's not enough, and you have to achieve weight loss effortlessly and, weight and, and natural health completely effortless, effortlessly. And you see, we see sort of um, dozens of these new, um, new uh, healthy eating gurus filling the pages of magazines, and they all sort of um, have their food philosophies and natural glow, and they talk about their journey to perfect health through their diet. They have sort of Instagram accounts which document their sort of incredibly glamorous, aspirational lifestyles, and they do yoga poses and headstands <laughs> in front of spiralised jets and, 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 and all, you know. I mean, uh, yeah, I'm, I am a fairly grumpy middle-aged chef, if anyone <laughs> reads my blog might my attest, and it's always naturally going to irritate me. But what irritates me even more is when you start scratching the surface of what these people are talking about, there, 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 there is something quite dark and quite unpleasant about what's going on. For something that really prides itself on 
on being this sort of aspirational lifestyle rather than, rather than a diet. And everyone will say it's not a diet, it's a lifestyle. I, I find it quite surprising that within its name, it has a clue to the actual pernicious nature of what it's talking about. It has this word clean in the, in the, in the title. And that implies to me, if some food is clean, it implies to me that other food is dirty and unpleasant and, and should not be eaten. And that's actually quite an unpleasant message for me. Um, it, 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 it's damaging, and by implication, I believe that it's wrong. You see, this is something that sells itself as this effortless path to a healthy lifestyle. But the reality of clean eating is it is just an old-fashioned exclusion diet. It is, uh, you know, it talks about cutting foods out of the diet. And in order to hide the fact that actually what they're talking about is weight loss, Many of these bloggers, and you'll know people I'm talking about, the Lisa Stiello and the Hensley sisters and, and, and the Natasha Corra, they, they talk about these, these um, they, they tell people to cut food out of their diet. Because they can't talk about weight loss, they make up all these pseudo-scientific reasons about why you should cut stuff out. They say that, that, that meat makes your body acidic and that the, the, the dairy needs just calcium from the bones and that <laughs> gluten is, is sandpaper for your gut. <laughs> Uh, yeah, for various reasons, they're told they have to cut out. You know, and I've got all these examples from different websites. Wheat, gluten, grains, potatoes, rice, pulses, dairy, meat, fish, fruits, <laughs> any, any combination of those, depending on who's looking good on, on social media and doing the best, best yoga pose. <laughs> and and you know, if you, as you get more and more of these people coming out, they obviously have to fight for, for a little bit of space in, a, in, a, in an increasingly crowded landscape of health bloggers. And, they will start to give me even more extreme advice as, as things go on. They'll talk about cutting more foods out of the diet. I don't know if anyone's seen this insane girl in Australia who just eats bananas. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, no, that's not, it's not actually a joke. It's, 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 a, a pretty, it's actually a pretty seriously unpleasant yeah. um, website to be honest. Um, yeah, so th th there's this sort of, um, you know, more and more things are excluded every day and, you know, it's just... The end point is, is excluding virtually everything, like the girl in Australia, or, or perhaps in, we'll find someone who, who just eat kale served in a bowl in a few years' time. I mean, they're, they're, these are often they're damagingly restrictive diets, and there's a serious point to it. It's damaging diets driven by the language of eating disorder, and these people are unqualified, they're poorly informed, and they're all very publicity hungry, and they have no regard for the danger that their, damage, that their messages might be calling vulnerable, causing vulnerable people. I mean, fortunately, in the real world, there is no reason to exclude anything from your diet unless you have a medical reason to do so. And my tip would be get that advice from a medical doctor or a dietitian rather than just off the internet. <laughs> the key to having a healthy relationship with food is to embrace a lot of variety and eat as many different things. So to sell a diet of restriction as something that is good for your health is actually completely the wrong message. I think we should be trying to encourage people to eat a balanced diet and actually enjoy food. Now, I'm a chef. I consider food to be life's greatest joy. And to have such a restrictive and damaged relationship with food, I think, is, is just is a terrible thing. No food should be considered dirty. No diet should be considered unclean. We should um, and no one should be made to feel even the slightest bit ashamed about what they eat. What they eat. And so many of these websites have these messages of shame. I find uh, deeply upsetting. This trend proclaims it's all about enjoying real food, but once you scratch the surface, it's often a dark underbelly there. Behind this veneer of effortless well-being, you find exclusion, guilt, and shame. And when you look further, the message is always based on dangerous, bad science.